What is up my Lurkana goons? Welcome back to the Lurkana goons channel. My name is Kevin and today we have for you a top 8 breakdown from the Card Monster Games Knoxville 2K tournament that happened over the weekend. Now this tournament was held in the United States, consisted of 29 players. So shout out to CM Games Cedar Buff for hosting this tournament with a $2,000 top cut prize pool that was played between some of these top players. So that's always cool to see. Um, if you don't know CM Games, check out their Facebook profile. If you guys are in that Knoxville area, be sure to check them out. They host a lot of tournaments. This isn't the first time that we've covered them on the Lurkana Goons channel. So that is really cool to see. Um, a lot of good players play at these tournaments as well. We're going to go over some popular names that we've talked about in the Lurkana Goon space before. So that's really cool to see. And because it is a fresh format, we do have a variety of deck lists to go over. So, so I'm pretty excited to get on into this. And be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you are a Lurkana Goon and you like this content because we do tournament reports and a bunch of other stuff but by the way this info provided by the CM Games Knoxville Facebook group but very conveniently put together by inkdex.com so big shout out to inkdex for putting together this tournament info for me and a bunch of other Lurkana players and the content creators and whatnot so be sure to check out that website for all your tournament info reporting so I do believe that the top four split so we are gonna go uh, from the top four uh, spaces and then top eight so shout out all these amazing players shout out this top eight and shout out this top four for splitting this prize pool pretty cool to see first up we have an emerald amethyst list piloted by travis jones now I'm, i don't think this is the first time i've mentioned travis jones on the channel but this this list looks a little bit spicy so we're gonna get on into this playing the photo is playing cursed merfolk we got pascal flynn rider we also have the petting zoo package of snake rabbits and goats and a couple ratios that we're not used to which is interesting so we do have four snake two rabbit three goats and two crabs um normally we see like four rabbits in amethyst decks like this but Cutting that out, I see, and we are still playing the four fox as well. Um, there is two copies of Pua in this deck, which is pretty cool. Pua is a two ink character with two strength and two willpower that will quest for two. So that quest for two ability, I'm sure, is important. As long as you have two drop characters that can quest for two, you're probably adding a lot of pressure. We're also playing Strike a Good Match. Ursula Deceiver, Friends on the Other Side, and Kit Cloud Kicker. All of those we're playing four of. Then we're getting into some draw power we have in this deck, like the rabbits, like I mentioned. We have Maleficent sorceress and then we're also playing friends on the other side alongside of that we're playing some cool tempo cards like mother knows best and genie only two copies of genie and we're also playing four copies of the legendary ursula deceiver of all now this card is beginning to make a big difference in the format a lot of decks are playing ursula deceiver of all especially these amethyst emerald tempo decks and i don't know did i miss the memo or something maybe i'm just not really super into some of these discords because this deck is like brand new to me when i saw it in the last video we made you know what I mean so I do want to mention if you guys like Lurkana content and you like keeping up with these deck lists obviously subscribe but make sure you're in some of these other discord channels like the Lurkana HQ or 20 Lore Pro because a lot of great players are building these decks and you know we're starting to see uh, some interesting card choices so I do want to go over some spice that I think is pretty cool to see in this deck like Bifoto. Bifoto is actually pretty good this format I think especially when you're playing against these tempo based decks you're going to be able to bounce back cards like Curse the Merfolk or the Flynn Rider and a lot of times those cards that a lot of pressure in the beginning of the game um especially because you really can't afford to just be challenging them and discarding cards from your hand for no reason so sometimes the photo is pretty good in the mirror match and a lot of times in ruby amethyst they're setting up a play of like mini or olaf so that they can use teeth and ambitions on your characters because you're playing characters with small willpower so if you are able to combo off the photo on the beginning of your game you're going to be able to stop them from having their own teeth and ambitions targets which is kind of good the photo is going to hit a lot of early game cards too in the meta like the new pluto card if if anybody's playing an amber deck or if you are playing an opposing emerald matchup you know you can hit some interesting cards with that as well probably some shiftable targets like the robin hood goons or the kita goons you know um you're going to be able to get those out of the way even some of the jafar shiftable targets you can get them out of the way with the photo before they can use jafar to shift so i think the photo is going to start seeing a little bit more play in this meta and in a deck like emerald amethyst tempo you're really limited on your removal and most of your most if not all your removal is going to be bouncing cards to the opponent's hand right and one of the best cards to bounce to the opponent's hand is going to be kit cloud kicker this dude is very powerful a lot of characters fall within this criteria of having two strength or less especially in the early game so if you are playing a mirror match or you're playing ruby amethyst or you're playing against most decks you're going to be able to target almost every card from like turns one through four and a lot of times when you're playing against this deck it almost feels like you just have an impossible time keeping your own characters on the board as soon as they start hitting turn 
turn three, you start seeing the kit, you start seeing the Mother Knows Best combos. If they set up Ursula, Deceiver of All, they start bouncing more than one card. And then obviously, Genie is gonna secure the bag for you by not letting them play any more cards post turn five. And Genie quests for two, and he has evasive. So that is a pretty powerful combination. I also wanna mention that Strike a Good Match is a very powerful card when you combine it with Ursula, Deceiver of All. If you sing it twice, you're gonna draw four cards and only discard two cards. And I think that's pretty broken in my opinion. So Ursula Deceiver of All is definitely seeing a lot of meta play. I think people are, might start playing some cards like Smash again to counter Ursula Deceiver of All. But overall, you have some pretty decent targets like Friends on the other side, Mother Knows Best, and Strike a Good Match. And you are playing four copies of each of those. So the ability to combo that all seems reasonable. I want to mention that cards like Pascal, Pua, Cursed Merfolk, they add a lot of pressure in the beginning of the game. So if your opponents are playing a slow deck, maybe even some of these location decks that take a lot of time to set up these combos, you're going to outpace them. I think one of the issues with like some of the decks right now that people are trying to play is that they're playing very combo heavy decks that don't really pop off until like turn five, six, seven. And this deck is going to start questing for two the moment they start dropping Cursed Merfolk, followed by a Flynn or a Pua. If you have a bunch of characters that quest for two, it's only going to take a couple turns for you to get to 20 lore really so this deck this deck does a really good job at not letting you keep characters on your side of the field so it can be a little frustrating i do feel like you are supposed to play a lot more rush characters this meta so that you can counteract their ability to just bounce them back before you can challenge them oftentimes when i'm playing ruby amethyst and i run into this deck i have a hard time keeping my characters at a location because the moment i move a character to the location they're going to respond with kit they're going to respond with mother knows best and gene and Kit has a bunch of targets, like I mentioned. They can bounce back your Rabbits, your Maleficents, your Puas, uh, pretty much anything, like I said, from turns one through four. But yeah, shout out to you, Travis Jones, for getting first place with this Emerald Amethyst list. I love to see it. I am so glad we're starting to not see Ruby Amethyst as much, but we do have more than one, more than two Ruby Amethyst deck lists in this top eight. So let's get on into these. Shout out Kendall Burdett, AKA No I'm Not on Pixelborn and Twitter. You guys need to follow this dude's Lorcana journey. This is not the first time nor even the second time we've covered him on the channel. This dude tops a lot of events very frequently in the Lorcana space. So really cool to see that he's doing it again with the new format and he's playing Ruby Amethyst. He was playing Ruby Amethyst a lot, all of last format is what it seemed like. And you know, he's showing us how to play a new format. But with, starting off with three copies of Mini, four copies of Olaf. We're still playing that petting zoo package, but we are playing four snake rabbit merlin and fox in this one we have four teeth and ambitions and four friends on the other side i think four teeth and ambitions is kind of mandatory right now there's so many people playing the emerald amethyst deck or just emerald decks in general like i mentioned before teeth and ambitions is gonna definitely add a lot of pressure in the beginning of the game your one drops are gonna survive your own teeth target and it's gonna be able to clear those problematic cards like cursed merfolk or even flynn rider and against amber decks you're gonna be able to pop the plutos before they can really get a lot of value out of those which is always good to see but one of the best combos with Teeth and Ambitions is combining it with Prince Eric, which is basically going to let you pop your Prince Eric and pop any other character on the opposing side of the board. You can actually pop your own characters as well. So for whatever reason, if you need to pop your own goat to secure that last game, you can, you know, use Teeth, kill your own Prince Eric, and then pop your own goat as well. So that's a neat combo. Kendall's still playing four copies of Minnie Mouse Surfer. That's cool to see Minnie Mouse Surfer seeing a lot of pressure starting from that turn three, especially if you're going first, you're going to be able to quest a lot more comfortably when there's not that many evasive characters running around except for like cards like genie which don't come down to like turn six and then we are playing crabs because in the mirror match you gotta respect the crab mini mouse interaction so if you are playing a ruby amethyst mirror match and you didn't know this if you have a mini mouse and they play a mini mouse make sure to keep your crab so that you can challenge their mini mouse with yours using your crab right or the opposite don't just quest with your mini mouse willy-nilly because they might have a crab to out your mini so it's a very important interaction and we're also playing cards like Jim Hawkins and a series of six locations, four copies of Queen's Castle, two copies of RLS Legacy to ensure that our Jim Hawkins will get that value. Now, the moment I read Jim Hawkins, I thought this card is really good. This card does something for free. Whenever I see a card that says free on it, I just think it's amazing. So Jim Hawkins being a five drop inkable character, he quests for two. He has a decent stat of four, four. And when you play him, you just get that automatic free value of being able to play a location for free and moving him for free.
free. So if you have Jim and Queen's Castle, you're saving five ink. You're basically playing 10 ink when you could do that combo and playing 10 ink on turn five is really unfair. So I think Jim Hawkins is very powerful in this meta. I don't know if it's mandatory in Ruby Amethyst because honestly, I feel like the deck can win without that combo, but man, that combo is pretty strong. And if you have RLS Legacy, it synergizes very well because you're also able to play for free. You move him to Legacy, he has evasive, and then for the rest of the game, as long as he's on there or any other character really, you only pay a move cost of one for the rest of your characters. And we've all dealt with Minnie Mouse Surfer in the past before. We know how problematic that card can be. It's quest for two, it has evasive, and a lot of decks don't play evasive characters naturally to out it. So imagine giving evasive to your foxes, your snakes, your Madame Medusas, all these powerful cards, some like Prince Eric that might even quest for two very confidently. It's gonna speed your game up a lot. And RLS Legacy gives you lore, and the Queen's Castle gives you two lore every turn. So I really feel like you don't really have to play Spellbook anymore this format. Spellbook seems like a thing of the past. Legacy gives you two lore and Queen's Castle gives you two lore. So why would you be playing Spellbook right now when you can basically play inkable Spellbooks that give you extra benefits on your characters when you move them there? A lot of times in Ruby Amethyst, it almost feels like you have leftover ink to use, especially now that we're not playing big old characters like Ursula, Elsa, Maleficent Monsters Dragon, you know, the highest cost card in this deck is going to be Be Prepared, which is a seven ink uninkable. We are playing four of those because, you know, why not? It's Be Prepared, right? But because you're not really needing to play nine drop and eight drop characters anymore, by the time you get to this like high ink level, you're going to be able to utilize your locations really effectively, especially because you're going to play like a rabbit on turn eight and you're still going to have four ink left. You haven't inked yet, so then you can play a Queen's Castle and then you can ink something and you have one more ink left and you can move the rabbit there so that's like a nine cost play instead of just playing one maleficent dragon now you can do actual combos with ruby amethyst like that which is kind of cool it is a little hard to keep your characters on the location sometimes because like i mentioned that emerald amethyst deck does a very good job at just bouncing your characters but man this deck no longer needs to play those big old bomb characters because you have plenty of removal with eric madame medusa teeth and ambitions and be prepared and it's looking like we're not playing tremaine anymore because madame medusa just kind of does what tremaine did but almost a little better you know what i mean there's very few cards that madame medusa cannot target in a lot of the meta right now but it's pretty much going to be able to hit genie the ursulas both ursulas actually the crabs flynn riders it'll hit kit cloud kickers it'll knock out any any mufasas most cards that mufasa brings out are gonna get knocked out by madame medusa so instead of playing lady tremaine and hoping your opponent only plays one character you know you can play madame medusa and start choosing the actual targets it does have to be a target with three strength or less but man there are a lot of Lorcanic characters that are being played right now that have three strength or less especially in a lot of the Mufasa decks because we're seeing a lot of people play cards like Lucky and Perdita and stuff like that and a lot of those cards are either a 2-3 or a 3-2 stat line and you know regardless it fits the criteria to get knocked out by Madame Medusa and of course we are playing for Maui because Maui is like one of the best cards in Ruby helps you out most of the locations and whatnot but I do also want to stress that playing for Fox seems almost mandatory this format especially with crabs because Fox and Crab in interaction lets you out the opposing queen's castle in the mirror match so you might want to keep playing your crabs and foxes in this deck and maui in general is going to let you out almost any location with maui and crab you know what i mean and like i said before we're not playing any seven eight or nine drops really in this deck so by the time you do have that much ink to use you can really start busting out some of these combos with crab maui or crab fox Next, we have an Amber Steelless by Zan Side, another Lorcana goon that we've covered on this channel before. So congrats to you on getting top four with this Emerald Steel Flute list. So the last Emerald Steel list we saw in the other video did not play flute, but this list is indeed playing flutes. I think flutes are really good this format, especially because we can combo it off with the best cards in the game, like Be Our Guest, Strength of a Raging Fire, and World's Greatest Criminal Mind, and even the new Uninkable Song, and then along came Zeus. This list is not playing Baroness which is very surprising to me, but we are playing for Cinderella Barm Sensation, the Robin Hood Goons, the Queen Goons, Force Me, which by the way, I did rank Smee in the Broken section in one of our other videos because I think Smee is really good. Um, so it's no surprise that we're seeing Force Me and most Steel lists. They're also playing for Ariel, obviously, and then the Big Queen and the Robin Hood Champion of Sherwood because playing that Robin Hood on turn three is a little overpowered. It's a five ink character, so you can use it to sing most of your songs, if not all of them in this deck. Um, it also lets you add a lot of pressure because you can start questing with it 
it early on in the game and it has six willpower. And from turn three, there's not that many cards in Lorcana that are gonna out this six willpower character. And then we're playing three copies of Rapunzel for the extra draw power, four whole new world because it's whole new world and only two grab your swords. I noticed that we're also playing the Bayou, which is very interesting, four copies of that inkable location. It's a one drop location, only has three willpower, but it does have that ability to let you dig through your deck. So for whatever reason, if you feel like you're not seeing your songs fast enough, you set up a Bayou play, you start questing with your characters, and you can start drawing and discarding to make sure you see your whole new worlds faster, or even some of the songs you need just to finish off the game. A little surprising that they're not playing Sad Beast in this list. I thought Sad Beast was like a staple in every Steel deck, but um, I guess in a flute list where you have plenty of draw power with Bayou, whole new world, and stuff like that, uh, maybe you don't need to waste your turn five on playing a Sad Beast and waiting for him to draw you two cards. So a very interesting list indeed. Flute taking a spot in this top four. Shout out to you, Zan side. I like to see it. Congrats again for these names that I've seen multiple times on the channel. You know, it just goes to show that when you are a true Lurkana goon, the skill will come into play. You know what I mean? There is luck in TCGs, but you know, seeing names consistently in these top eight, top four breakdowns is reassuring to see because I do believe that skill is a very important part of TCGs. Next up, we have an Emerald Amber Mufasa list. So this list playing some interesting spice indeed. We have the four Plutos, obviously, but we're playing some copies of Pain and Panic to get some extra lore and add some extra pressure. We see the Pig Pooh Pirate Captain in this list, and I do want to stress that this card is actually pretty, pretty good. A lot of people underestimate Piglet and how much lore he's really gonna generate. It is only a two willpower character, so it does lose out to teeth and ambitions, but oftentimes like people forget that it's gonna end up questing for three if you don't let if you don't get rid of it immediately. Of course, we're playing Doc, Kit the Cloud Kicker, which is amazing. We're also seeing Pongo in this list at three. Now Pongo's a character that lets you pay two extra ink in order for you to get a card from the top of your deck. It has to be a character card, and in this list, we're only playing characters. No actions and spells except except for the two copies of Bare Necessities. So the odds of you seeing a character are gonna be pretty good. Um, I do like playing minimal copies of actions or songs in a deck like this because you do wanna kinda capitalize on cards like that. And in mirror matches when your opponent's using Bare Necessities or if they're using Ursula Deceiver, you know, it makes it a lot harder for them to resolve that. So there's probably a scenario where if you see somebody playing Emerald, you wanna ink your Bare Necessities before they play Ursula Deceiver, right? Some interesting spice though with the Mufasa targets that I like to see. So we are playing Mufasa Mufasa obviously, but um, some good cards you might want to see off Mufasa are probably Ray. We have Genie for that tempo. We have the Perdita, like I just said. Uh, when Perdita hits the board, it's going to be able to bring a two cost character from your discard pile onto the field. And then next turn, it, because it'll be ready off the Mufasa, you could just quest with it again. You'll gain two lore, which is good, and you'll bring out another character. So that's a lot of pressure. I think cards that get their effects when they quest are so good. I, I, I get a little sad when I see some cards that make you choose between either Exert or questing but when I see cards that do both at the same time they activate their abilities while they quest it's so much free value and I do want to mention they are playing two copies of the seven drop Dr. Facilier. Now this card is an evasive with 4-4 four, four willpower and strength and has an ability that says when this character quests, chosen opposing character can't quest next turn and it has three lore. So bringing this off of the Mufasa is pretty nice too. So you're going to be able to gain three and stop an opposing character from questing which can slow the game down against a lot of these Emerald Amethyst Tempo decks that we've been seeing. And last but not least, we are seeing three of the big Pluto four of the Surfer Stitch, and two copies of Chernabog. Chernabog is seeing a lot of play in Amber decks right now. It has very good synergy in this tempo-based character deck, which is cool to see. Obviously, your opponent has to challenge all your characters, start using removal on them in order for you to not quest for game faster than they do. And once a bunch of your characters are in the discard pile, your Chernabog ends up being almost free, probably only paying four to six lore to play a 10 drop nine nine character. I love to see it. We also have Tinkerbell most helpful in this deck, which is going to be really good against the opposing evasive characters. A lot of people are still playing Jafar Amethyst Steel. Oftentimes, this is going to let your cards like Queen Commanding Presence or even that Dr. Facilier get a lot more value by challenging characters like that because you can give evasive to your own characters, which is pretty cool. And I say this every time we talk about Tinkerbell most helpful. If your opponent has a bodyguard character, you can give that bodyguard character evasive. And basically, now your characters can't challenge the bodyguard character, so it basically negates 
negates the bodyguard effect and your characters can challenge the other characters again. So that's a very important interaction with Tinkerbell most helpful that I think is going to go a long way this format. I do want to mention the combination of Pluto and Doc is really good because on turn one you can play Pluto. If they don't have an out to it you can use the effect and then you can bring out a Doc a turn early and then on turn three you're able to basically have three ink available but two extra free ink with these characters. So you can start playing five drop characters like your Mufasa's, your Queen's or your Ray's on turn three which is really strong. This deck is pretty cool. I love seeing character decks. So this was a top four. So congratulations to all of our top four players. Nathan Tripe, congrats on bringing Mufasa, Emerald, Amber up to the top four section. That's pretty cool to see. Next up in top eight, we have another Ruby Amethyst list. Now this list looking a little bit more aggressive in my opinion. So it is a kind of, it is kind of spicy playing some cool cards like Chernobog's Followers. We're playing the one drop Forbidden Mountain location. We're playing four copies of Agrabah as well. Um, and we also have some copies of Hey Hey. We're playing LeFou, Pascal, Maleficent biding her time. We have a small package of Mim characters only playing three snakes and four foxes, but surprise surprise we're seeing Arthur in this top list that's kind of cool I didn't think Arthur would see a lot of meta play this format especially because Arthur gets hit really bad against the opposing kit cloud kicker in those emerald matchups but I have experiences before from playing Arthur plus LeFou combo is extremely powerful and if you're comboing it off in an aggressive style like this that's playing 15 locations that's like almost playing 15 spell books you know what I mean if you're playing a gang of locations and Arthur's and LeFou's I think you're gonna be able to get to 20 lore pretty fast we're also playing four copies of Jim Hawkins, especially in a deck like this where you're playing a bunch of locations, you're going to be able to definitely maximize that value on Jim Hawkins. Like I said before, man, playing Jim Hawkins plus almost any other location is like playing free ink on that turn, which is really powerful. And if you're playing Jim back to back and locations free back to back, it just feels like free lore. You know what I mean? You're more than likely going to be able to get to 20 way faster than the opponent. We do have the draw power in this deck of friends on the other side and only two copies of Maleficent, four copies of Minnie Mouse Surfer. Very interesting. I feel like Minnie Mouse Surfer is never going to leave the meta, I guess. I am I was kind of weird about playing Minnie Mouse Surfer in my Ruby Amethyst list because I felt like it might have been a little bit too slow, maybe outdated, but I might consider, I might revisit Minnie Mouse Surfer and play four copies again. I'm only playing two in my Ruby Amethyst list, but this aggro list is playing four, uh, Kendall Burdett's list is playing four, so it, maybe, maybe the cards is just that good still. Four copies of Maui, obviously, to make sure you can out several locations as well. I do want to mention that Hey Hey is an interesting card to play. It is a 2-3-2 two, two character. Um, I think this card is as good as playing the Minnie Mouse on the scooter. Forgot what the name is for that one, but um, you no longer have to play that card because it's a vanilla and you can play Hey Hey now. And anytime Hey Hey moves to a location, your opponent loses a lore. So against those aggressive decks like Mufasa or Emerald Amethyst, this is going to give you a lot of extra value, especially since you're playing so many locations. It doesn't seem too outrageous to be able to resolve this ability. You are only playing two, so it probably doesn't come up too often Often, but a character with three strength is still really good in the format and it's an inkable two cost character So if you are in a bind and you're falling behind against the opponent You can easily play a hey hey move him from one location to the next because almost all your locations only have a move cost of one So that's pretty cool It's a lot of value there to be able to make your opponent lose a bunch of lore in one turn even and it's better than cards like Lady Tremaine um, Because Lady Tremaine specifically says your opponents have to have more lore than you in order for that in order for them to lose a lore, which is kind of bad in my opinion. And Hey Hey does not have that stipulation. It'll make your opponent lose a lore if you're at 10 and they're at 5 or vice versa, which is great to see. But Ruby Amethyst seeing a lot of play in the meta still. So if you thought that format was over, it's not. But this deck is not playing goats. It's not playing rabbits. So it is a little bit more refreshing than some of the other Ruby Amethyst lists from last format. Next up, we have an Emerald Steel list in top eight. Finally, an Emerald Steel list because I feel like we weren't seeing these at all. You know what I mean? So Emerald Steel was very hyped in the beginning of the format and in my opinion I think the deck is great But I think a lot of people are focusing on the combo a little bit too much But this list seems like it might not be focusing hundred percent on that combo because we are only playing two copies of Bayou Two copies of Sheriff Nottingham and we are still playing the four copies of Beast Relentless But we have a bunch of cards in here that I want to go over like four copies of Captain Hook a very good card in the meta Since chapter one we're also playing the four Robin Hood goons with the four shiftable Robin Hood from Sherwood. That's really nice 
case for Morph. Morph is pretty threatening in a deck like this because you have a variety of shiftable targets like Robin Hood, Tinkerbell, we have the Sad Beast, and Helga St. Clair, which is a five drop uninkable character that'll let you basically deal extra damage to already damaged characters. We're playing a gang of songs in this list because we are playing the Ursula Legendary Deceiver of All, so that synergizes with our four copies of Strike a Good Match. Let the storm rage on, strength of a raging fire, and we're only playing two copies of Honu World and Grab Your Swords. There's also two copies of Chief Bogo, which I didn't expect to see. I thought Chief Bogo was a little outdated, but we do have a variety of Floodborne characters since we are using that morph to be able to shift. And in general, post turn five, most of your big characters are gonna be Floodborns, except for Beast Relentless. But four copies of Beast Relentless does make sense to me in this list because you're not necessarily abusing the Nottingham Bayou combo when you can use cards like Ursula Let the Storm Rage On, you know what I mean? So that alone is already gonna let you deal four damage to different characters on the board and draw two cards and if you have a beast relentless when you start doing these plays you're gonna be able to generate that value anyway so I feel like a lot of people were trying to max out on those four cards and trying to keep those three cards in their hand until the right moment to do this crazy OTK combo but it doesn't really happen like that I feel like you can't really afford to leave three cards in your hand right now in Lorcana because the game is way too fast so I do think that playing on curve is really important basically playing you know a one a, a one drop on turn one a morph on turn two and then on turn three if you can shift your morph, you're gonna get a ton of value. But if that doesn't happen, you still have high potential to get some pretty cool value with that Ursula Deceiver of all on turn three. And the two drop Ursula is gonna be able to, you know, look at your opponent's hand and snipe a song out of it. In general, I think looking at the opponent's hand is really good. Whether or not you get rid of a song when you do that, I think almost doesn't matter. Well, I mean, it does matter because you get the free value, right? But if they don't have a song for whatever reason, you still get to see their entire hand. And most of the time, you can predict what they're gonna do. Obviously, you don't know what they're gonna draw for their draw, but in general, you can already assume, okay, he doesn't have outs to my beast. He doesn't have outs to my Ursula. So now you know what cards you can play next turn. And Tinkerbell Giant Fairy seeing a lot of meta play. In general, this card is just amazing. It lets you combo stuff off with Sheriff Nottingham too. If you already have a Sheriff on board and then you play a giant Tinkerbell and you have a character that can sing some cards, you can use like whole new world next turn and then you ditch your hand, draw a new hand and your Sheriff just starts pinging a bunch of cards for one damage. So Emerald Steel seeing popularity in this format might not be the best deck but man this deck is still pretty powerful i wouldn't call it an otk deck i think this is more of an emerald steel control variant that i like to see and i think it's going to go more in this direction personally so shout out matthew walker for getting this top eight with emerald steel the first one that we cover on the channel congratulations to you bro now amethyst steel has been making some waves in the meta we have a couple cards in this list that are pretty cool shout out ryan grabe for piloting this amethyst steel list and taking it all the way to top eight in this tournament we're playing cards like captain hook which is just good in every format we got the Robin Hood goons, we have Blue Fairy, which is pretty cool, we saw this in, in the other video as well. We're playing a variety of Jafar targets, like the 2 Ink Jafar, the new 3 Ink Amethyst Jafar. We're also playing two copies of Smash, which is good to see because I think Smash is really good this format. Three Maleficent Sorceress, we're playing four friends on the other side, and one copy of Queen's Castle for our Amethyst draw power. But if you need extra draw power, we're still playing four copies of Whole New World because Whole New World and Jafar are very good. We got, and then along came Zeus at four, we're playing Tinkerbell, Tiny tactician to ensure that we can shift as well for sad beast for giant tinkerbell to robin hood sherwood to elsa which is very surprising to see three grab your swords and then only one yzma for some extra removal and even some potential draw power so you can trigger your jafar now obviously we have jafar in this list jafar being the newest character in amethyst that lets you gain lore anytime you draw a card and we have a total of we have a total of 11 shiftable targets for this jafar considering we have the four ink jafar as well that you can shift from your other jafar so it's a pretty cool card adds a lot of pressure and if you're able to keep this card on board shift it early it's gonna get a lot of value anytime you draw a card and if we're combining it with blue fairy you can do an interesting play where you quest with one of your like three drop jafars and then when you shift your your seven drop jafar onto your jafar that's already quested he'll come in exerted so that means blue fairy will let you draw a card and you can still gain that lore with your newly played jafar that's already exerted he has evasive too evasive is gonna keep him on the board longer than most other characters but in the mirror match he does lose out to along came zeus so that's probably why a lot of people are playing and then along came Zeus at four. This Jafar combo deck obviously is gonna generate a lot of lore if you resolve it with whole new world, but I feel like that's not the whole combo. So that's why we're seeing a lot of draw power in this deck like Blue Fairy and friends on the other side, even Yzma and the Queen's Castle. 
And then Elsa is our only big boss character. I'm pretty sure you don't need to play too many of these uninkable eight drops, but when the game starts progressing, especially against some of these aggressive tempo decks, playing an eight drop Elsa probably feels pretty good on the opponent. You're able to stop them from questing, which is always nice. And Elsa's a Floodborne too. So this is gonna trigger your blue fairy. Plenty of targets for your blue fairy, ranging from Jafar to Yzma to Robin Hood to Tinkerbell to Beats. So if that blue fairy stays on the board, it's gonna get a lot of value. So I do feel like people are gonna start playing cards like Fire the Cannons, maybe even the two drop Robin Hood to out this. But in general, very, very powerful deck. And last but not least, we have Dominique Roberts with an Amethyst Ruby deck list. So Ruby Amethyst still seeing a lot of popularity in this meta. That's the third one in this top eight. And this deck is playing a variety of cards. We got four Minnie Mouse, two Olaf, and then we also have the package of petting zoo mim characters like Snake, Fox, Rabbit, Goat, and Crab. We're gonna be playing friends on the other side at four, three Teeth and Ambitions, two of the new three Inkable Jafar. This card lets you look at the top two cards of your deck and pick your next draw basically. So one will stay on top and one will go to the bottom and it happens when you play this character. So it can add some consistency in your deck, but it is only a two willpower character with two strength, but he does quest for two as well, which is kind of powerful. We got four Maleficent Sorceress and three Maui with one copy of Ursula and three copies of Maleficent Monstrous Dragon. So a lot of people aren't really playing Maleficent Monstrous Dragon anymore or big cards like Ursula, but obviously Dominique is seeing some success right here with these big boss characters. So that's kind of cool to see. I thought that that was going to be a thing of the past, but you know, it's looking like there is still some value in playing some of these bombs. Only three be prepared in this list and we're playing two Tremaine and only one Madame Medusa. So this person opted to still play Tremaine in their list and a combination of Madame Medusa as well. You know, maybe it was because of it card availability, but maybe they just prefer two Tremaine instead of the three Madame Medusa. You know what I mean? So if you do have Tremaines, you can still pretty much play it in the format. You know what I mean? And we are playing only two copies of Jim Hawkins in this deck, but only three copies of the Queen's Castle. So there is a ratio there going on. Maybe you don't want to max out on both of those because of how often you might not see them both together. But I imagine if you mulligan into them together, you'll probably just keep it because like I said, on turn five, when you're playing a location for free and moving it for free, you're basically using 10 ink for the cost of five only with Jim Hawkins. And that is a very powerful combo. But Ruby Amethyst seeing a lot of love in the new meta, still a very powerful deck. So I do think you guys should prepare for it. I am a little surprised to see four copies of the Merlin Crab. Um, we're not playing Minnie Mouse in this list either. So there's not a lot of outs to evasive characters outside of your removal, but four copies of Crab did kind of surprise me. It's a very interesting list. And I do feel like you, there is room to play big boss characters like Ursula, Maleficent Monsters Dragon, but I do want to know how often those really came into play and how often were you able to actually play them in such a fast format. At least I feel like it's a fast format. But that is going to be all for this top eight breakdown from the Card Monster Games Knoxville 2K tournament that happened in Cedar Buff. So shout out to all these players for doing good at this tournament. Congratulations. One of the first tournaments of the new format. It's looking like we don't have like an outright dominating deck, but we never know. Remember last format, everybody was playing Ruby Sapphire Popsicle and that was like the dominating deck. And right now there is a lot of meta diversity. So that is cool to see. And it does get Give us an idea of what we should be playing around when we enter tournaments ourselves. So I'm looking forward to see what happens with this meta. I hope it stays this diverse, but as time goes on and we all start net decking these lists, we're probably going to see some changes. But until then, remember to stay tuned to Lurkana Goons, and we'll see you goons next time.